big sound in a small town Far away from the big city lights Making music every night Good music with all our friends Tell everybody, tell your mama and them We're going out and we're getting down A big sound in a small town 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 Welcome to season four of Big Sound Small Town. I'm your host, Sandy Carlton. Join me as musicians tell their stories about how they became musicians and the stories along the way. Hey y'all, I'm Samantha Snyder. I'm from Lexington, North Carolina, and I'm a violinist and a vocalist and a songwriter. And I currently work for Darren and Brooke Aldridge and have been working for them for almost two years, coming up on two years. And uh, I grew up in a family band, so I've been spending my whole life playing music. And uh, in my free time, I farm and write stories. So that's uh, me. <laughs> that's a good in introduction. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. I so I saw pictures of you with goats. Yes. I love goats. Yeah, I do too. It's been a busy couple of weeks. We had two that um, gave birth during the, the winter storm that came yeah. through. Oh, yeah. So, because oh, that's when they oh, always wow. choose to do stuff. <laughs> so, uh, farm run itself while you're on the road? No, actually, so my dad takes care of the animals okay. while I'm gone. It's fully my farm, and um, the, the only thing that's, that's shared about it is its family land, So, sure. um, which is actually one of my favorite aspects of it is yeah. that it's you know oh, yeah, carried be great yeah. yeah it's carrying on the heritage sure. of my family and um so it's on family land but it's all i've got 20 goats total now which is crazy Ooh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah i started out with two so that's yeah that, that is a lot yeah that's and a lot then of work. yeah and six chickens and and two dogs and uh yeah just a lot of a lot of desire to learn more about it too do, so. so do you call yourself a farmer i you know it, i kind of I struggle with what to call myself because it really is, it's hobby farming because I'm not doing yeah. it for a living, wow. but it's also learning skills and kind of, you know, obtaining a way to sort of keep yourself grounded. I, and I, I call myself an urban farmer Yeah, because yeah. I live, I have land, but I live in the city limits and, yeah. but I have animals and I have honeybees and I have blueberry bushes you know I yeah mean, so. gosh that's the best stuff yeah. I mean a lot of people are, are shifting towards that now because it's, uh, 
you know, it's kind of, I'm kind of like you. I kind of didn't know any different. I thought yeah. that's what I was supposed to do, really. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, uh, I like to learn. Oh, I like so. to learn in general, and I like to learn about that kind There's of stuff. There's a lot so, you can uh, learn about that. Oh, <laughs> it's endless. <laughs> so did you, with your family band, did you start out as a, as a violinist, a fiddler? Yeah, that was sort of, I was technically the start of our whole, like, music experience um, when it comes to who started playing a stringed instrument first. Um, now, to back up slightly before I get into that, my parents were both really into music from an early age, and they were both in band at their respective okay. high schools and all that. Um, my mom played the clarinet, and my dad was a drummer. Okay. Um, and my dad was just absolutely obsessed with music, and he wanted to play drums for Leonard Skinner one day. I mean, that was <laughs> that was what he had his sights set on that. And uh, so he, um, he, he, he loved it, and she loved it, and so we had a lot of music in the house, just what we were listening to, but yeah. neither of them played while we were kids. Um, and then we were actually homeschooled all the way through from the beginning. And so one of the things my parents were trying to figure out was how do we recreate the experiences we got to have in right. band at, you know, in sure. our schools yeah. when they're doing it from right. home. So they put me in Suzuki violin lessons. It's, I'm a full believer yes. in it. That's an ear development as opposed to a reading more so. It is. And yeah. Uh, it's, it's great. I mean. It builds it builds musicians. It, it it really does. Yeah. So it doesn't just build a guitarist or a violinist. It builds right. a musician, and that I, I think that was a really central part of of setting me up for success. Yeah. Um, and I had a great great teacher who was very patient with that's me. Um, and she, I was three years old when I started. Oh, really? Is, yeah. Which is the te- that's what Suzuki tends to. Yeah, they that's like, like the age. I agree. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. It is. Um, and um, so you're just old enough to like understand what they're telling you to do, but not old enough to be past developing some of this key instincts so i did that twinkle twinkle is not a stretch you know at that age (laughs) yeah it's something you want to play yeah Yeah. exactly yeah um so i did that for a few months and i progressed pretty steadily and they could tell that it was something that i clicked with right um and so they put my older brother he would have been seven at the no Yes, seven at the time, and uh, they put him in classical guitar lessons. Oh, okay. Um, and he progressed the same way. You know, right. you could tell he Weekly. had the, the skill for it. And he he wasn't in love with the genre. He wasn't in love with right. the things that he was getting to play. Sure. But he enjoyed improving. And I remember he had some friends in the groups that he worked with that, you know, he wanted to beat them to the next skill level sure. and things like yeah. that. You know, oh, just yeah. the good, mm-hmm. you know, competitiveness. And so... For a few years, that was what we did, and the interesting thing was, since we were both in the same curriculum, just on different instruments, um, we learned some of the same songs at the beginning. Yeah, that would be good, yeah. Yeah, and um, so our parents had the idea to just let us try out playing together, you know, just those same songs, and uh, so we just did that in the living room, and we enjoyed it, and then it started to sort of... um, it started to sort of progress from there where we were like, well, what else can we learn that might not, not necessarily be part of the curriculum, but it's you know, just hymns and folk tunes. Sure. And um, we found an Irish songbook, so yeah. we could kind of read that music yeah. too once we learned how to read a little bit. And um, just sort of started experimenting. And then the next thing we knew, um, some local venues, you know, were inviting us to play. And when I say venues, I mean like we were playing senior centers and sure, yeah. um, I mean, that, churches. That, that's and That's what you're supposed to do when yeah. you start. I mean, that that is your audience Well, when it's you're great. Starting. And they're so, it helps when you're cute little kids too. True, and they, it, like, everybody, helps a lot. Yeah, yeah they, helps. they want you to, they want you to sure. enjoy yourself and they want to give you good feedback. So we, we were get, met with nothing but support that's from great. very early on, which is, I'm so I mean, fortunate to have had that. Support for musicians is key anyway. Yeah, especially at that young age. Like I you, you and I were saying before, before we pressed record, you know, there are some kids that that's had been their experience of music and they right. were disciplined very strictly with it um sure. to the extent that they laid it down and then oh yeah wish they'd done different when they got older oh, yeah. but um so we were really lucky to be in that positive environment um and we enjoyed it we enjoyed playing together and we figured out we enjoyed playing in front of people um mm. and then just kind of slowly it morphed into bluegrass because that was something that it's fairly we're fairly surrounded with it in our region. True. There's not really any at all in our actual town in Lexington. Really? No, there's it's not. Just barbecue, right? Yeah, it's just barbecue. <laughs> literally, <laughs> there's barbecue, and they'll bring in some beach music and stuff there for like go. the yeah. um, for the barbecue festival, and sometimes sure. a big country artist. But there's no. Right. And now I've heard that there are. It's like the pockets of bluegrassers in Lexington. We always miss them by just a hair. Um, yeah. So, I think there are some around that. If just y'all, if y'all hear me on this trail. podcast, yeah. please contact me because I'd like to jam. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> uh, but um, but yeah, so we but the whole area around us is full right. of it. It so is. We found a. Um, this is a bluegrass town. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And we found our first sort of hub of 
like bluegrass learning and um, kind of just music in general learning was um, Union Grove, North Carolina, sure. Cook Shack. Yeah. Um, and just a remarkable place, and I've never been anywhere like it. Um, and uh, those people took us under their wing, and we started, you know, learning. We started learning some bluegrass, but it, they, they were the perfect group of people because they weren't just straight-up bluegrassers right. that had this, like, if it they had the old, the old time. They had old time, and then they right. had a lot of old country, too. True, that's true. Um, and then there was always, they do, like, sort of a Merle Haggard segment <laughs> in, in the middle every morning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that was a great thing for, for Zeb and I because we always had diverse musical tastes because our parents did. Right. So that was perfect. Um, and, yeah, we just kept on doing that, and then we – conspired to buy our dad an upright bass ah. and uh that's so that's that's what that's i mean a good about it working backwards for a drummer though that's yes. a good transition for a drummer yeah that was the idea also I, I i guess that uh having a dad that was a drummer i guess there's a lot of emphasis on time there was time and timing i actually i have um great memories of when i was getting into you know reading sheet music for the first time at a very young age um i was looking at like the just the different ways that you can convey rhythm on sheet music oh, and trying yeah. to figure all that out. And I remember I had like sort of a beginner's notebook for it and I would sit in my dad's armchair with him and he would help me beat you out the count rhythms. It out for yeah. It. So, cause that, he knew that stuff, sure. you know, he had right. it down pat. So, um, yeah, that was very, we, that was, um, something that was just part of our experience. And, uh, so that was the idea behind, you know, getting him on bass is like, it would be, I mean, we have a built-in rhythm expert here. Right. So exactly. I just got to learn is how to hold the thing, how to exactly. pluck the strings and what yeah. notes to play. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, it's no big deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> but what happened actually is my, my brother taught himself how to play bass with the bottom four strings of the, of the guitar. Yeah, because sure. at that yeah. point, he discovered bluegrass. We found a bluegrass teacher in Asheboro, Tim Moon, yeah. who was great at just lighting the fire under his students to, right. to just fall in love with bluegrass music. And he just made it cool and made it exciting. And Zeb at like 11 or 12 just all of a sudden took off. He, right. he, he picked up a flat pick and it was like he never put the instrument down That's again. great. I mean. Yeah. And so he wanted to learn everything he could get his hands on. And he would lay there. He's told me about how his brain would work. He would lay in the bed and just think about what instrument he wanted to learn and like practice it in his mind. Visualize it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and he had an incredible ability to do that. So he did it with the bass and then turned around and taught our dad. Right. what he knew sure um so it was really a backwards development yeah, from what most is. family bands yeah, have it is kind of because usually it's the parents you know are musicians and they just you're born and ta-da yeah. you yeah. are handed an instrument yeah and, pretty yeah. much this is what you're going to play yeah yeah so um yeah and it just from there it was it was you know the rest was history now, to, now okay somewhere in there <laughs> I, I know that you know how to do this because yeah. i've seen you doing it so where did the learning to sing harmony come from that so that was from my mom's side of the family. She grew up singing. She grew up singing in church, and she had uh, three other sisters, right. and so they would sing harmony sing parts harmony. around the yeah. campfire yeah, sure. and at church and in the choir. Yeah. So that was a big part of her experience, and she loved it. And um, so she, from an early age, we we were just singing. We'd sing in the car, right. uh, listening to things, and um, you know, it wasn't like a lot of technical singing lessons or anything. It was just sure. this is what you do. You just yeah. sing along with music, and here's how you harmonize with it. So that, combined with the Suzuki ear training, helped us develop that True. sense and, and of that, harmony. Well, I mean, I agree with that because it does, particularly with Suzuki. But uh, playing instruments, you realize a third and a fifth, and yes. you know, it's. Uh, yeah. A little easier when you have that as opposed to just being a singer. Absolutely. And I think an interesting thing for me is that I, I kind of knew what a third and a fifth was before right. I knew what, a third what and it a would. Fifth yeah, was. Well, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> which, again, you know, not many. I mean, it's, it's I feel lucky to have a, been able to approach it that way. But, um, yeah, so we have lots of memories of singing in the car with with music. Um, and sure. I think that that directly contributes to to, to the, the overall love of sure. the art. Well, I think it does, yeah. But yeah. So, I mean, because it's rooted in so many things. It's your life, really. Yeah. yeah. So, and we ended up, um, we, we kind of did a, we played some local things, and then we took a chance and went to the Asheville um, First Class, or Bluegrass First Class yeah. Festival mm-hmm. um, that they have every year in the winter. And uh, I think it's usually like right around Valentine's Day, actually. Yeah, I think it is. And uh, we went there, and it was actually Tony Rice was there that year. And oh, he was okay. playing. He guested with Balsam Range, and he always did great with those guys. They right. made him feel, like, comfortable and yeah, relaxed sure on stage. Did, yeah. And 
um, at Josh Williams was there, was there playing mm-hmm. with him in another format, and J.D. Crow was there. Sure. We just lost, and, uh, you know, um, Rhonda Vincent, just all the, yeah. the greats were there. So we were starstruck, but we brought our instruments along, and they have a, um, a workshop stage. All right. Um, or, uh, not a workshop stage, an open mic stage is what yeah. I meant to say, um, the Sunken Lobby, and we were like, we, 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 we walked up that. to whoever was managing that and said, can we what? play it? And they said, uh, we don't have any open slots on the schedule right now. And we were like, okay, that's fine. And then we went into just a little conference room off the main hall and just got our instruments and started playing together, the three oh. of us. And some people started walking in because I was little. I was like eight years old yeah. and I had a little dress on. And, you know, my brother was, he would have been 12, 11 or 12. And uh, so that just attracts Oh, yeah, people. of course it did. Yeah. yeah. And um, so we just started playing, the three of us, and – we just kind of drew a crowd, and before we knew it, the person from the um, open mic stage came back and said, "We've got a spot open." If you oh, find yeah, all of a sudden we have a spot. Yeah, <laughs> they, you're yeah, they all found the business. Some space. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, next thing we knew, the um, the person who runs the festival, Milton Harkey. Yeah, um, I know Milton. So yeah, he's a sweet man, and um, he heard us and he put us on the main stage for like a 15 minute set. And it was between, if I remember correctly, it was either between J.D. Crow and Rhonda Vincent or Doyle Lawson and Rhonda Vincent. Right. So, I mean, gosh. Right, pick one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I matter. know. Um, so, and that really, that really is what helped us take off because there was a promoter there from Georgia and a promoter there from South Carolina right. and first time traveling out of state. And it just, I could go on about the whole progression, but that was yeah. semi-shortened yeah, yeah, version yeah. Of, yeah. of how it took off. And then 12 years of traveling the, the country. That long? 12 yeah. years. 12 years. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy really so then how did you wind up with Darren and Brooke so um in 2018 we for you know the year leading up to 2018 and and that year the family band was we were realizing it was winding down and nothing had happened um we weren't all trying to kill each other or anything as happens with some family bands but it was starting to wind down and I think part of it is uh, family bands are very hard to sustain for long periods of time even if everything is going well sure and part of it is you, is if you started it as a kid, then your image kind of freezes in time in a certain place. And once you become an adult, even if well, we, we took it very seriously from very early on. Right. Um, and we never wanted to be thought of as getting attention just because we were young or just because right. we were cute or whatever. And sure. And, we, and I understand that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And we quickly became uncute when we reached adolescence, yeah, too. I mean, so. I mean, that happens, too, you know? <laughs> that, yeah, that was a little rough. There were a few years there. It was a little, <laughs> a little yeah, dicey. Yeah. But um, so, you know, just over time we realized this, we can't, we're not, we're not grabbing attention like we used to, right. and I don't think we're going to be able to get that back. Right. And it, so it was just a natural sort of decline. Sure. Um, it was very, it was very difficult and very sad, just because we all loved what we did. So what did you do when when that Ugh. starts coming to an end? I mean, I know you're still wanting to play. I bought goats. <laughs> That's what I, did. I am not kidding you, Mandy. That's what I did. Is I was like, because I was really sad, and I would kind of hit these waves as we approached like our last show, where right. I was like, first of all how the heck am I going to get to this last show without bawling my eyes yeah, out on stage I'm the whole sure. time? And then, you know, just what am I going to do after that? Right. And I was in college at this point. Um, so one of the, the main answer to that was, you know, I'm just going to keep my head down and focus on my studies because I was, uh, I was maintaining a 4.0 GPA and yeah, trying yeah. to, I was perfectionist to the highest degree. So I had to, sure. you know, do my best at both. And it was like, okay, now you just focus now on you just college. Focus on one. Yeah. But I also knew you're going to stress yourself into the hospital <laughs> if you don't have anything sure. to distract you. And I'd always wanted pets and we'd never been able to have them because we were literally <laughs> oh, always Oh, I know. Oh, you have to have a house sitter yep. to take care of you. I understand that yeah. real, really well. Oh, yeah. And I just so happened to, my granddaddy had always, because of our farming heritage, he always liked having just livestock or something around that he could take care of mm-hmm. um, just as his hobby. And he had had some boar goats that I used to just follow around oh, like yeah. I was part of the herd. Yeah. And uh, so that was what I was familiar with. So I bought a couple goats and um, and just really focused you know, just threw myself into like the animals and the farm for a couple of years. But that whole time, I mean, I was heart sick for the road. I mean, you just don't, you don't, you don't lose that. Were you, you getting to play it. any music at that I time? I wasn't. I was not. And that, I mean, that was really hard. We, so we, our, we put our last show at the barbecue festival, um, in Lexington in 2018. It was, so it was like October of um, 2018. And, um, and then that was it for me for a couple of years. Me and Zeb did, we had kind of booked on the spur of the moment like a little christmas show at our church and that so we did that and then um 
that was that was it and I really didn't get to play on stage I I was still writing songs and still playing with my guitar and stuff so I still thought of myself as As a musician yeah because you can't (laughs) if you've been doing it since you were three and professionally since you were seven that doesn't go away um and the other thing too was that I had developed or I'd realized that I was dealing with some really serious anxiety, which um, had kind of come in, it runs in the family. And so it had kind of snuck in and started really messing with my performances. So my actual performances, nobody would have noticed, but the lead up was always very difficult for me. And it was a mental battle the whole time. And it was like, it felt really strange to me because that was not natural for me. I was very comfortable on stage. I loved what I did. So that was a struggle that I was dealing with too when the family band retired. And so there was a little while there where I was like, well, maybe I'm supposed to stop because something's not right here. Um, but the longer I was off the road, I was like, so, so how did you correct that? Um, medication was a big thing. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it was a serotonin deficiency. And sure. the only way you can fix that is to get you some serotonin. Sure. So yeah. I, so I got on medication and uh, I started some counseling, you know, some a few months after that. And so there was, there was a period there of, of healing that yeah. I'm still in, you know, because right. once you discover that you should have been taking care of your mental health this whole time, then there's yeah. a long yeah, well, it's a lifelong thing. <laughs> I'm glad you found that because you know yeah. so many so many musicians never find they that. don't. And you know what? I, it's something that I realized. You know, as I was dealing with this as a young adult, I was like, I would never do this, but I understand now why there are so many musicians that are alcoholics sure. and drug addicts. And I agree. yeah, I mean, it, because they're just it's a lot of pressure. It's I mean, even when you pressure. enjoy it, sometimes because you enjoy it so much it and is. care about it so much. And then then there's a lot. If you're already feeling that way, there's a lot of hurry up and wait down time that yes. you can just get yourself into trouble oh with. yeah the and people do not realize that they see you on stage and they think it's wonderful but they yeah. miss the travel they miss the yes sitting up or get your sound check and then mm-hmm. what do i do exactly i always the the lull in between sound check and getting on stage was a nightmare for me the last few, last couple of years it was always a nightmare for me <laughs> i'm okay playing yeah but but sometimes that that lull in between yeah it was like what am I going to do I don't really have skills to do anything else. yeah right. and and you're, you're totally right that people don't understand that because if you haven't experienced it then you wouldn't ever know and so you know sometimes at venues we would be people would be coming backstage to talk to us or somebody one time somebody came up with like a camera and wanted to do like a video interview like 30 minutes before the show and you're very much in the I'm just trying to get my head in the right, right. place headspace so it's something that nobody would know without you know true. experiencing it so this I don't true but um, but yeah, so there were some some thoughts that maybe I was you know wasn't cut out for it anymore, which was just that was just the anxiety. Yeah, I mean, and the I, depression I, mean I guess you thought well, it was fine when I was a kid, but maybe yes. I'm supposed to move on. Yeah, yeah, because I mean I dealt with the music like I dealt with school and anything else that I care about, which is I got to do this right, and I, I mean if I mess up, <laughs> it's the end of the world. Yeah, which I knew I was taught you know, by all the musicians around me that that's not what it's about. That's right. not, you know, it's right. not that you mess up one time and that's it. You yeah. know, nobody even knows when you mess up. Most they don't. don't. I mean, mo- most professional musicians, oh, maybe the people that you play with know, but no one else exactly. knows. And, yeah. they're, and they're, you know, everyone learns to cover their mistakes. If exactly. you do it very long, minimize them. Um, uh, and the few times that it's, blatantly obvious usually it's a big laugh everybody has a great True. laugh together and then you move on like if you forget lyrics oh, or something oh I, speaking of tony rice i saw him <laughs> just stop right oh, yeah. there, you know and start over you know so. oh yeah and if you're tony rice you could totally do that you, you can totally do that but <laughs> oh, i figure yeah. if tony rice can mess up yeah i can mess up no kidding so i that was the thing and that's when i realized that it was a mental health issue is i knew all those facts and the irrational was still there right. yeah which is when you know there's a, a problem but as I started to get better with the mental health and realized that, okay, some of this irrational anxiety is going away in my day-to-day life, it might be that I can do this again. Right. Um, that's when I, I really started missing the road um, and, and thinking about, and I was missing it terribly even before that. And Zeb fairly quickly transitioned. He'd actually already started, I think, playing with um, Daryl Webb. It was the Daryl Webb band at the time. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I and, know, uh, know Daryl. Yeah. yeah, and then quickly following, and he played with the band of Kelly some, and then quickly following on the heels of that, it was the Appalachian right. Roadshow, which he's still so, with. So he was out there, yeah. you know, doing things, and it was different because he had already graduated. So right. I was and, still right. He's older, him. and he had already found his path. Yes. I guess you were feeling left behind him. I was. I was, yeah. and, and, you know, it was never something that, like, you know, I would say, oh, this was Zeb sitting here. Like, it was right. never something that I, like, held against him or anything, but it was, like, 
dang, like we both love this. Right. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm seeing now that I'm home and he's on the road sure. that I want to be, I wanna do I wanna that be there too. Yeah. Like I miss it. So um, that was eye opening. And uh, so I knew by the time, by 2020, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm coming back into this. Like, there's no, there's no doubt about it. And I was writing songs and I started kind of trying to put more things out on my YouTube channel. And just, I was like, somehow it's time for me to like kind of come back on the scene. Right. Um, and Darren, meanwhile, (laughs) had been contacting me for a couple of years about playing with him and, uh, just at different times, um, when, when his other fiddlers couldn't make it and right. things like that, sure. cause he, I'd known him for a long time right. ever since I was very little. And so he'd call me up and say, you know, so-and-so can't make it. Can you fill in with this? Right. And then, um, when he had the open position, uh, after Carly had started her own band, right. you know, he called me again, but all these different times that he called me had been during everything that was going on. Right. Where it was like the family band was retiring. I was a mess. Right. I wasn't even sure I wanted to play. So I, you know, I would just tell him, you know, it's, it's not a great, not time. A great I, time. I'm very honored that you would ask me because it's Darren Aldridge. Yeah, I mean, gosh, sure. and, uh, and to get to play with him and Brooke would just, you know, it's an incredible honor. And, uh, but it was just never the right time, but you know, I'm so thankful to him. He, he believed in me and he kept on calling, you know, and he'd give me time. He was never mad. He was, and he would just give me time. And then he'd call back the next he's time. He's a very determined guy. Though, yes, he is. That. He is. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. He's, um, yeah, he's great that way. And he just, yeah. I think he knew there was something there that it was going to make a good match. And so he, he contacted me in 2020 in the summer and was like, um, we have this live stream concert and, you know, we need to put together a band for that. Do you want to play a fiddle for us? And I was like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that was my first time stepping back on stage. And that, since. Was, and that was with a live stream, so not a live yes. audience. Yeah. And it was the perfect little in-between That's show. True. That would be good. Yeah. And you, you had a, you had actually a bad time to decide to come back. 2020, yeah. it was dead. No, yeah, no kidding. No kidding. And really, the, my best hope was kind of like what you were saying about the podcast is, you know, People the online listen stuff. People I can find somebody, I can find a place to go. Yes, but I didn't really have any organized way of going about that. I mean, right. just the videos that I was putting out every now and then. But, um, but I was like, yeah, this sounds like I can't pass this opportunity up. And uh, Zeb got to come along, too, because um, whenever whenever Zeb can, we like to have him along with right. Darren and Brooke to have, sure. uh, you know, that second guitar is yeah. so great. And, gosh, Zeb's rhythm is spectacular. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Drummer for dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, and that by that point, I was doing a lot better ment- mentally and could tell that from my other source of stress, which was college. I was already managing that better. So I knew I wasn't going to go and just, like, crumble or anything but I did in the weeks leading up to it I I, you know I talked to my counselor about it was just like you know I want to make sure I'm in the right headspace for this and uh, I had a great counselor at college that really talked me through some just good coping skills and things like that and uh, so that day was just it came off like a dream and I did encounter stress and I managed it in a way that I never had been able to before and uh, the show was just perfect it couldn't have been any better and um, I mean, we knew that day it was like, okay, this is yeah, this is gonna, gonna work. Yeah, and um, I mean, well, he probably knew or he had never kept reaching out to and, you. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, yeah, and I'm so honored by that 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 he you know thought it was worth the the effort to keep after me when I was shooting him down. Well, I have to say that he has great great talent. With <laughs> he does look at look at his players. yeah look I at mean, his record. There, <laughs> he's had wonderful ones. They're yeah, there you know. Absolutely. You're just another another wonderful in the line. Well, I appreciate it, and it's it's been an, it's been truly a remarkable experience. I knew it would be great. I didn't realize just how great it would be playing with them. Um, the 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 dynamic with them is something that I appreciate so much because I'm sure as you, you know, I'm sure you've experienced in different lineups. Well, who, not, who you're with? Sure matters a ton it, oh it matters a ton it's like being and it's literally like being in a relationship it's like plus know. i've noticed it's a pretty good vocal uh oh god mix, <laughs> mix too you know i mean that can yeah. be problematic too it can I mean, I mean two excellent singers don't necessarily always exactly uh, sing well together yeah yeah you can have two of the top singers in the industry yeah. and they just and don't just blend, doesn't right? work it just does it's not a good blend yeah and i think something that helped me be prepared for blending with them well was I, I commuted to college, um, so it was a 35-minute drive there, um, and um, and that was every day. So I had a lot of time to listen to music in my car, right. and when I did that, it, and to this day, I cannot not sing with whatever I'm listening to. Right. Um, I mean, even when I'm in a bad mood and just, like, 
white knuckle in the wheel. I mean, when the song comes, I just have to. And I would always sing harmony parts. And we we didn't we actually didn't do that a ton with the family band, which I think surprises some people because that's what you think when you think family True. band is harmonies. But we our ranges, my mom's and my because my mom would come on stage for like a song a specific right. song to sing because she didn't play an instrument. Um, so we would do like a couple gospel songs here and there, but our ranges, when we all hit our voice changes, my brother and I, they like scattered oh, it went in opposite directions. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I and, understand that. And it just happened to be that, like you said, that combination of we couldn't fit it together sure. right. Yeah. Um, so it happened. Yeah. So that we, we, we kind of, that kind of deteriorated from the band in the sense that we stopped putting songs on the show that had harmony right. before, like several years before we retired because sure. it was just, we couldn't well, figure out how to do it anymore. Age, it happens even more. It's more yeah. noticeable than as it is. It is. And your voice is breaking. And it is. <laughs> um, so the, where I feel, feel like I really learned, I mean, obviously that experience was the core of, of becoming a good harmony singer, but where I learned how to really, um, compliment the lead singer and follow their lines and their style and everything was literally from just listening to the the music sure, that I loved on the road yeah. and the same albums and and learning those singers and how they functioned sure. and matching that. I mean that's a big part of harmony. Really. Yeah, it yeah, is. and it's it's something you don't think about is like your main way of practicing is just singing in the car. But it really, I mean, it made a big difference for me. And then when we had the live stream show, Darren sent me the set list beforehand, and right. so I had all their recordings, and so I could really match up to Brooke right. well. And I, I grew up listening to Brooke. I mean, she was on the radio mm-hmm. every every Sunday. Sure. Uh, Dennis Jones would play us on yeah. um, on uh, going across the mountain. Sure. I, I loved him, and uh, a nice, was a nice guy. He really was, and he he was I think probably the first person to play our music, um, our very probably first was. album when I was like eight or nine. He probably was, yeah. Oh, I'll never forget running up. I had my little voice recorder, and when he would talk <laughs> about us and introduce our songs, I was like, he's, he's saying something, he's saying something, and record what he was saying. Sure. I still have that somewhere. And there's nothing like hearing your song on the radio. <gasps> oh, my gosh, the, yeah. If you've never had that, you've really missed something yeah. in your life. because first it was just, you know, fiddle tunes that we recorded, and then eventually it became st- songs that I'd right. written. And that's yeah. like, that's oh, your baby. Oh, that's even better. I oh, yeah. totally, yeah. It's your heart and soul on the radio, which sure. is just uh, the dream. But, um, but yeah, so I, we would always, like, we'd hear our track played on a Sunday or Saturday morning, and then Corn would come on, like, very soon after that. Or And so I, I was always, um, I always heard Darren and Brooks. So I, I'm very familiar with Brooks' voice. And then, I mean, that's a, those are big shoes yeah, to, I, I mean, I, that, I mean, it's I, a, it's quite a role to support, even. It is. It is quite a, quite a role to support. That yeah. is a fantastic once in <sighs> ten lifetime voices. Oh, it just and it just flows. I mean, she's just so naturally talented at it, and she's been doing it since she was little. Sure so it's does. just part of who she is. And same thing for Darren. He's an excellent vocalist oh, as well, yeah, as well is. as an instrumentalist. He, and, oh yeah. And then Billy G on bass is uh, we uh, we all love and everybody loves Billy. There's not a single person in this world that doesn't like I Billy, agree. and uh, and he's an incredibly talented bass player. Um, and then Jacob Metz is our is our dobro player, mm-hmm. and he's extremely talented. I happened to have run into him just a few years ago. I think it was in 2018, maybe 2019 at IBMA, yeah. and he um, was in a jam session I was in, and that's how I met him. And I was like, where? Where has he been hiding? Exactly. He's amazing. Yeah. Because um, it's hard to find good Dobro oh, players nowadays. Oh, it is hard. Yep. Um, and he was excellent. So we we all just and, and our sound guy um, Brandon is is fantastic, and we all just get along great. <laughs> yeah. And we make stupid jokes, and we have a group text chain, and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's just it's the ideal environment to be a That's part right. of. Um, and then to get to go to the Opry with people like that is so t- the icing t- on the cake. <laughs> so what about t- just tell the listeners about your very first time? Oh. I that I could not and I've said this ever since it happened we played it two nights in a row for when we debuted it was on uh July it was fourth of July weekend um in 20 2021 um I could not have designed a better weekend than the weekend that we had um it really was it really was bizarrely awesome like there was there was nothing that took away from it it was perfect really um so we we went up the day before, which sometimes we go up the day of and sometimes the day before. But we had um, coffee and country with Cody. I always say that wrong, but it's a right, I mean yeah. obviously a big right. radio show um, in the Opryland Hotel. That was like sure. first thing that morning at like seven o'clock, and uh, I think that's the moment when I realized, oh yeah, like we're playing the Opry tonight. It's like you're surrounded by just country music. You're sure. like at the you're at the heartbeat of country music, and I was like, oh this is this is happening. 
Um, and, and it got real for me. And everybody was so, I guess everybody I was with had gotten to play it before. Zeb had gotten to play it before with, with um, Daly and Vincent. And he met us coming from a different gig to play oh. with us that night. Um, and then um, Jacob, the next night was going to be his first night. He had had a prior commitment um, before the Opry got booked. And so oh. the first night we had Ron Blocks in and with us, actually, <laughs> which yeah, is crazy. Terrible. I mean, yeah, I, I, don't know how that, I don't know how good that uh, would be. Oh, my gosh. So that was already – I knew that was going to be great. Um, and then we just kind of hung around Nashville that day and then um, got ready to go and just kind of – you're just kind of in a dream state as you drive over there. It's like, am I really driving to the Opry right now? And um, we – Starting from the moment that you drive in, and I know you've experienced this, starting from the moment you drive in yeah. and talk to the guy at the security gate, not, everybody's wonderful. Yeah. And I was I was honestly surprised by that. It's not like I thought it was going to be a bad experience, but you run into even some of the venues that are really popular in bluegrass music or any, people get kind of jaded. And, they and there are things behind the scenes that are just like, ugh, it's just, yeah, work. It it's just work, you know. And that's – so you always run into some of that. And there was like – none of that there which was truly remarkable um the i mean the security guard that like we had to walk through the metal detector he was nice and the <laughs> person that checked us in was nice and i Plus was you got to go in the door yes uh, you know. oh gosh yeah walk down that yeah, musician's yeah, yeah. interest and get my picture and everything yeah. oh yeah i was yeah, over the too moon. cool but i was just kind of taking it all in and then um and we stepped backstage and darren made sure to take me around and show me all the different rooms sure, and yeah. you know each one has a different theme and i was really impressed at just how like spacious and and just there's a good vibe backstage and it's there's no like chaos or clutter it's like peace of mind and it obviously helped a little bit that it was during the pandemic and so it was like a little bit quieter backstage but even when it's busy back there it's a good it's a good vibe but um and I got to see where they'd marked the water line right have you been I don't know if you've been there since that happened but yeah yeah. oh yeah it's really crazy to see um and then we were actually lucky enough to have a sound check that day which you don't usually get at the Opry um, cause there's so many musicians going to be there that night, but we, um, I forget why we needed to do it or were able to do it, but they got us dialed in, you know, beforehand. So I got to stand on the stage before showtime, Yeah, that helps. which, too. yeah. And that was really nice. Um, and it was just, I got to take it in and I was really something that I noticed and Jacob noticed this too, when he played it the next night is that you expect to be very dwarfed and intimidated by that room. And it felt a lot more. Um, intimate than we were expecting it to and I think like just to compare it like the Duke Energy Center Center in Raleigh yeah. is so it's such a big room and it goes it so is, far back it does, yes, and it you is. just really feel like you're here and then there's a chasm and right. then there's this huge audience that's just really. looking at you because I've, I've played that one too for the award show which is always like full of people um, and the Opry is more like it's it's stacked more it is. and I, it, there's something about they're just right there with you yeah. that to me instead of being super Super intimidating. I mean, obviously it was intimidating, don't get me wrong, but instead of being where you felt like there were a bunch of people judging you, it was like you were all sitting together and enjoying this experience. Um, but the, I think one of the things that made that night a highlight, besides just the fact that you were freaking performing on the opera right. for the first time, is uh, Riders in the Sky was there. Yeah. And those guys have been my heroes for forever. Yeah. Um, we got one of their albums when I was little and just, we wore it out then. And then I rediscovered it as a teenager and just listened to it over Ranger and over Doug. again. <laughs> yes. Ranger Doug. And then Woody Paul. Woody Paul. Yeah. Fiddle sure. was a huge influence of mine. I think the way he expresses himself on fiddle yeah. is really unique. Really well, well, it was, it was different than about anything that you yes. heard because it was kind of rooted in Western swing, exactly. but not. Yeah. And it, you know? they helped me discover how much I love Western swing. Right. I, I connect to that genre in a way that yeah. I can't even explain. I think it's because I've got Texas roots, so yeah, it's somewhere in be. my blood. You know? But, um, but yeah, so they were there, and I was like, I wonder if I'll get to meet him. And I remember looking up at one point while we were practicing um, with Ron Block again. That was incredible. That yeah. we, We've gotten to meet him in the past, but it's been a while. Right. And one of the songs that we did, Blue Baby, has a very much an Acus vibe it, to it. Does, yeah. So Ron, to have Ron's sense of rhythm on that was mm-hmm. just incredible. But um, but I remember looking up, and we were in the duo room that it takes two room, and that's where Darren and Brooke usually are at. And I looked up, and I saw just like a flash of like fringe and rhinestones go by. And oh, so yeah, I looked yeah. at that, and I was like, <laughs> I think that was one of the riders. And uh, in a little while, Darren had been kind of milling around backstage, and he came by the room, and he beckoned to me, and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And he took me around the corner to the practice room where the riders were right. warming up. 
and I got to meet every single one of them. Oh, that's cool. And they were just, they're so gracious and just classy. And, right. and then Woody Paul, like, stopped for a picture with me. And, you know, he had a cup of black coffee in one hand and his fiddle in the other. They were yeah. literally about to go on stage. That's too cool. And he just leaned in and got a picture. And I was like, that in itself was enough. But when they, they use, they, a lot of times they'll open the show because right. there are members there. Um, did, did, is that who went on before you? I was going to ask you who went on. So do you remember who went on before you? The person right before us was Emily Ann Roberts, who's yeah, fantastic. Right. Um, so she was right before us. I think it might've been the writers and then Emily, Emily Ann and then us. There might've been one more person in right. between. Um, but it wasn't like the first half right. of the show, um, before the intermission. But, um, so they had come off stage and Woody actually like packed up his, his instruments and stuff. And then somehow we got to talking to him again before we went on stage. Like we, um, we're waiting in the wings, talking to him, and which was just surreal that I was standing in the wings of the opera <laughs> talking to Woody Paul. Right. And then he goes, um, I'm going to step out in front and watch y'all play. Oh, that's too cool. And I was like, you're going to what now? <laughs> and uh, so he kind of disappeared, and then we went on, and um, we got to play three songs, which is another thing that right. um, you know you feel lucky to do when you're there. And um, I'll never forget, this is, this is another example of just how great the Aldridges are, is they specifically – there and said, let's do Sally Gooden in this set, which is, that means Brooke has to step back and, sure. and just, and you she was, do, yeah. I mean, you carry in that. I'm, yeah. yeah. And me and Zeb grew up playing Sally Gooden as our closer for like every show. Right. So, and Darren knew that he knew that was like our song. Right. And, um, he said that I want to do that, you know, for the two of y'all. Cause, um, it, to, to get to experience that with Zeb Sure. for my first night yeah i think that's wonderful i think that's magical yeah and we had i mean we dreamt about playing the opry ever since we were little i have a song that i wrote when i was i think 12 where i mentioned i still dream about the mm -hmm. opry um and we never made it as the family band right. but here we were but you made it here we were yeah and we were together you know right. and and um he was standing to my right, and every I swear, every time I looked at him during that show, I, I get a lump in my throat. I'm I was sure. like, "You, yeah. <laughs> you got to oh, stay focused sure. here, because yeah. you know we're you very close." Get one right now. I know, I know. I am. <laughs> 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 I'm glad this is audio. I'm going to start mascara running here in a minute, but um, but yeah, you know, he he and I are very close, and, and you know, we've been in this together since the beginning, sure. so that was emotional. And then uh, it went great. Everything went awesome with the show. And then we stepped off stage. And there was kind of a stunned minute where I was just kind of standing back there in the wings. And then the waterworks definitely started. I, I cried. Just, yeah. You know, because I was standing there with Brooke and, and Billy. I think it was sort of the three of us in a circle. And, you know, they were just hyping me up and like, yeah, I'm so excited you get to do this. And, um, and I, just, I just started crying because it was like, I think in that moment, I saw all the things that had come together to get sure. me there and all the people that had come together yeah. to get me there. And it was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Because it was a lot of years of work to get to that point. Oh, and, I agree. Um, and it wasn't over then, you know. And I, I knew I'd get to have more experiences yeah. and possibly on the opera again. And um, and then Woody Paul comes backstage <laughs> and had seen us and was super sweet. And then we walked down the hall from the wings together talking about fiddles. Yeah. And, uh and then, like, I stopped and talked to Ron Block for a while about teaching. And the whole time I still had, like, tears in the corners of my eyes because I just – so, I mean, it was just – I literally, I'd, I'm still tearing up thinking about it. But um, it was a beautiful night. And then we went to Logan's afterwards and stuffed our faces sure. and laughed. And it was I mean, it can time. eat then. I mean, yeah. You and can't then, eat before because it's got that – I know. <laughs> oh, not, yeah. There's no way. No, I'm not eating. Oh, yeah. So I had a good I had a good meal and a blue, blue moon after that. Yeah, and, uh, and then the next day we got to play it again, which is – crazy and then and um, easier though yes and easier way easier yeah and then it never loses the magic and no. Darren and Brooke have said that and it's just very true and just a few times that I've been it's like you you get more like centered you know the more you go but mm. you, you still like yes, you're still in magic. all um and it was great seeing Jacob get to do his night there right. and then we went from there they sent SUVs to us from the Ernest Tubb record shop in on Broadway so right. it's the one that they haven't had shows in for a while right. And they picked us up in these like black SUVs and escorted us downtown because it was in all of the traffic from the Fourth yeah, of July. Right. And we played the midnight, um, oh, yeah. uh, what's it called, the midnight jamboree yeah. there. And uh, that was incredible because it was like Elvis had been on that stage yeah. and Ernest Tubb and and Loretta and just all the the greats. A lot of Loretta stuff was just on display mm -hmm. around the stage. So it was just like it was the ultimate like country music weekend yeah I mean, I mean the whole deal was yeah yeah and just a dream come true so yeah i could talk about it forever but those those are the highlights is, that um, is pretty cool it was a, it was a humbling and yet you know uplifting weekend i'm I'd, sure i came rolling back into town like yeah and, 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 uh, i guess uh 
the struggles just disappeared after that, didn't they? Didn't they? Yeah, and you know, I th- one of the beautiful things that, that also makes me emotional when I think about it is I remember thinking in, in my darkest days of having anxiety, right. you know, and that anxiety manifested in a lot of different places, but like I said, one of them was performing. I remember thinking, if we ever do make it to the Opry, I don't know that I can do it. Right. Uh, I just don't know that I can get myself on that stage and do that. Like, it's just going to be too hard. Um, yep, not. with my anxiety <laughs> and it was so smooth that night I mean of course I felt the butterflies and the wings but it was back to the experience that I knew before the anxiety had started taking over which was those butterflies are good right. like you're a little nervous because you care and this sure. is like you know of course you're going to be nervous going on the Grand Old Opry stage yeah. but I wasn't shaking in the bathroom like I used to right. you know I was ready to go yeah. and then you just get to experience that great it's really a great adrenaline rush it's a good thing it's like yeah. you're a little nervous you get up there it goes great you come off right. and you ride that high for a sure. couple hours oh. you, I never need to take drugs because yeah, exactly. that, yeah. that's like I mean it's yeah so and it really from there I think that being able to do that was like okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> we're good I, yeah I mean I, yeah. I think that pretty well says I'm 100% back I'm ready to go yes oh yeah you know yeah and and they they were so great and we'd gotten to do so many great shows already that I, w- I was already feeling very much like I'm back but that that moment standing in the wings getting off the stage that first night was like yeah. oh I, I'm I'm really back I'm and, really and back. it's, it's better than real. before even yeah. yeah I agree um so yeah I mean very very lucky to have gotten to do that okay. and I'm going back tomorrow night so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah that's another thing too she is going back tomorrow yeah. night yeah. yeah can't wait um what else we need to know Samantha uh, oh, um, a big thing that's happening, um, and that it actually, I think this has started to happen, yeah, it had started to happen, like, during the retired years of the family band, before Darren Brooke and everything, is I started teaching fiddle lessons online, um, and doing it over Skype. That was something that Zeb has been doing for years, and it's a great way, especially during the pandemic, to right, teach lessons, um, to people from all over the country. That's the nice thing about it. I mean, I've got... So let's plug it while we're at it. Yeah, yeah, oh. so, so what's happened is... I, I still do the, the lessons on Skype, so you can find me on um, my my website is samanthaclairsnyder.com, and then I'm on Facebook too. That's a great way to contact me, and my my Facebook uh, business page is Samantha Claire Snyder. Right. Um, but so I'm doing that. I'm teaching individual lessons on Skype, and then I also now have what I call the School of Fiddling. So it's the Samantha, Samantha Snyder School of Fiddling, um, and it's set up on Patreon. Okay, yeah. So, because a lot of YouTubers are doing Patreon sure. now, it's sort of a way to, to sort of... Podcast does Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, podcast does it. Yeah. yeah, it's a perfect way to sort of like interact with your fans. And, sure. and um, but the way I wanted to do it was, I do have a tier for people that just want to like subscribe and get exclusive content right, and stuff yeah. like that. But I have set it up where you can subscribe to my school of fiddling and then you have access to instructional videos that I've right. made and put together because I've... I've um, a skill that I picked up pretty early in the family band was editing videos and sure. making high quality content. And so I've created instructional videos that um, walk you through from the very beginning. So since that's what I experienced starting yeah. at, a, at a very early age, um, and I've created it for people of all ages, um, I walk you through, I mean, buying your gear, right. like what you need to get started. Sure. Um, I've got videos for parents if there are parents with little kids that are um starting to learn just to sort of let them know like right. you can do this it's gonna be okay it's yeah. been done before and uh yeah and then just posture and how to tune it and sure. all those things and walk them up through here are your essential fiddle tunes right. and then i have that and all the way to advanced um fiddling so we talk about improv which you and i were talking about before we got on sure. it's one of the most intimidating hurdles for even very advanced violinists it is i agree hit. totally so I talk a lot about that, and um, I even have some songwriting instruction on there as yeah, well. That's great. Um, so yeah, it's, the, it's my Samantha the Snyder School of Fiddling, and you can um, you can access it from my website or just from Patreon. Sure. Um, on Patreon, it's patreoncom slash School of Fiddling. Sure. So that's All that's right. the most that's uh, radio that's talk I'm going to get. That's here, but. Right. Well, that's good. I mean, that, you know, it is important that um, I want people to that listen to support the people that are on here. Well, I mean, I that's kind of kind of the whole idea of it you oh, know? I appreciate it and so. you know it's a I mean teaching has been a great way to I mean it's it really is sort of a uh, a pay it forward type of thing you know where it's yeah. like I had so many people that have given me valuable instruction and advice just about not only how to play your instrument but mindset and sure. and I, I really try to incorporate some 
some messages about maintaining your mental health too because yeah, those good. can yeah, get tangled oh, up yes that's very important yeah so i wanted to because i didn't really have that for many of my instructions so i want to tell people like take some deep breaths <laughs> and and sort of and sort of get in that positive headspace so um yeah it's a great way for me to to really pass on what i've learned and the it's been gosh 20 years now since i started <laughs> and uh and the many more years to come you got many more years to come yeah you yeah, can uh, unless you do like me, retired five, <laughs> five or six times, over and then thinking, I don't, re- I don't think I want to do this anymore. Uh, and then it's what, what were you thinking? Yeah, yeah that's like, what I, I laugh about is that I using the word retired when I was nineteen years yeah. old was hilarious. I was yeah. like, are you kidding me? You've retired, really? Yeah. And, and then if, and like, you know, it's one of those things too that uh, you get tired sometimes. I yeah. think, and it's like I, don't, I just, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Yeah, well, especially in music. And but, then you stop doing it, and it's like. <laughs> I was so wrong, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like oh. Yeah, and being a musician is like you have to have a very you have to be self driven enough to to get have the mental toughness to get through the like. You, you do. I mean, I mean, the time on stage is never a problem for yes. anyone. It's being it's, handed the paycheck that's like way below your worth, or the exactly you know, being asked to play something for free, and I'll give you a hot dog. Type oh, right. Of thing. Or it's or playing that. for a handful of people. Yes. Or driving too far to play yes. for too little. Yeah, or like and the sound system squealing, just all the different exactly. things. Exactly. It's yeah. a very, you have to like, and sometimes you just have those days where it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I just yeah. need to I go. Mean, <laughs> people, it is, it is a great way to make a living, and, and most of it is fun. Oh, yeah. But uh, it's just like every job that you ever have of any type. Of course. It, some days it just stinks. It's, that's the truth. You know? But But, you know, and then directly opposing that are the moments that you step off stage and you go i just got to do that for oh, yeah. a living oh yeah um and i have that feeling every time i come home from from off the road is like oh yeah. that was my job i just got to do that for my Somebody's job Somebody's paying <laughs> me to do that oh listen even at my age sometimes i'm thinking i actually get paid to do this yeah no know? kidding yeah and i've got paid to do this for like a long yeah. time yeah yeah you know? it's 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 remarkable. It really is. And then I, then in my, in my case, then I think people are glutton for punishment. <laughs> you know? so. Well, I mean, it's just when I, when I have doubts sometimes about like, you know, sometimes you can feel like since we're not in the technical sense of the term essential workers, you know, where we're not, we're not running the things that, that maintain society. Like technically speaking, you sometimes wonder if your, your worth in your profession is lower. And then I think, how many extremely hard times have I gotten through solely because there were there was music that music I music that you to. listen to on the radio or, or that you yes yeah. I mean I think that's it's been a part of society as long as it's been a yeah. society absolutely so it's 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 essential I think to people's uh, mental and physical health both that's the truth I mean it really I mean, is there are some people that are are totally non-music people and yeah. i guess they substitute something yeah there's something it. else yeah but so many people uh you take music away from them and i don't know how much joy there is in life yeah i know it's it's um it's a sustaining and, and those energy. and those are not necessarily musicians too there's so many exactly i mean one of the things i try to tell people all the time is list people who love music and listen to it and go see it or every bit is as important as the people who play it yes because you couldn't play it you could play it but but what would it be worth if no one came to listen exactly I mean I have people that have been such constants in my life when it comes to being supporting and enthusiastic about my music and they they don't play and they but they just always like are so supportive and they're they always send me nice messages whenever yeah. i do something and i just i try to tell them as often as i can like i love you like yeah, you don't understand oh, yeah, like, I do. oh <laughs> yes i do understand that yeah, totally because it's like you know it's it it, they, it, it can't i mean they're, they're the validate, reason that i keep on going it kind of validates the whole reason you ever yeah. do it you know uh, yeah i mean i'd sit and play it in my room if nothing else but sure. like but when it somebody makes you realize you're being heard and that does. and that you mean something to somebody, it, it does. And, oh, uh, and that's always amazing to me. Yeah. Also, you have pockets if you'll if you'll probably not learn this as you go along. Yeah. Where, where, oh, you got this little following in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. Now maybe they don't <laughs> like you in in Waco, North Carolina. Yes. But but whoa, there's that little pocket in Cleveland that yeah. think you're the best thing that's come along. Oh yeah, me and Zeb laugh because the road show ends up playing in Wisconsin a ton. Yeah. And it's like. 
you, you don't just automatically assume like the Appalachian Road Show right would is play would play in Wisconsin, it, particularly and, in Wisconsin. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. they and they love them there. We always joke we we call it the Spotted Cow Tour when they go up there because they always is, hunt, yeah. hunt down the spotted cow well, <laughs> deer when they're up yeah, there. <laughs> sure, I mean, <laughs> I mean you can't you can't hurt that. That's well, and I, and I guess I guess that is the part of the draw. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, farmers are farmer. I guess. Oh yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, it's it's a remarkable thing. I appreciate you taking the time to come down here and do this. Well, thank you for having me. This has been awesome. Well, thank you. Like the 